Okay, very good morning. Tuesday, 26th of June. Um, topic of discussion very much so is still on the, the trade war. Um, the developments that we saw, kind of an escalation in some sense and a retaliation, at least in the terms of a verbal sense from the Chinese last night, uh, saw equity markets come under some quite distinct selling pressure. And we're going to have a look at that in a bit more detail. That really is uh, the main thing to focus on. And then we'll have a look at the calendar for the day ahead. Um, just looking at where the charts are, though, as we get the European UK session underway and things have calmed down quite a bit. And what's quite interesting is how the Trump administration are taking on the kind of the central banking tactic of rolling out someone who's uh, quite a, uh, a trade hawk, you would say, he's been quite vocal uh, in a sense in this whole build up in targeting specifically the Chinese and that's Navarro who actually was used as the, the pawn if you like to come out and really talk down the gravity of what it is that, that Trump and Steven Mnuchin said yesterday um, that caused was the catalyst for a lot of the initial sell off. Um, so since then things have calmed down. You can see European stock futures are in slight positive territory a minor gap up. Uh, the DAX, though, is still sub-pivot. Eurostock sitting at around those levels. The US futures also just in mild positive territory. So now the, the ship has steadied and we've got a bit of stabilization across the various different asset classes uh, with equity seeing a, a minor bounce. Uh, Treasuries, the opposite of what we had when we came in yesterday. So the 10 years down, about six ticks. The Bund down, pretty much the exact same increment that we were up this time yesterday. So down about 40 with gold down um, just over four bucks at the moment. Um, first of all, though, let's just cover off what exactly happened um, yesterday. And actually, just looking at what was very interesting, it really took the entrance of our friends across the pond before the selling pressure really picked up. We had kind of a, a mild negative response seen. Uh, this is the futures trade and the reopening during the Asia PAC session on Sunday night going through into Monday morning. And really in the European session, it was a relatively range bound, slightly lower uh, movement during the, the best part of the first few hours until the US came in. Uh, we punched through that European low and then the selling really took hold. and. The main thing here is about Trump's trade threats over the weekend, the potential investment restrictions on China. This is when we're specifically looking to target on the technology side. Uh, this was exacerbated by Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin suggesting that this was not just specific to China, but all countries trying to steal US technology. This then obviously broadens out the horizon of this trade war moving beyond that of just China, an all out assault on the global front, which makes it all the more uh, kind of dangerous of a matter and its implications for um, damaging of uh, global economic growth. If beyond China, everyone else starts getting in this routine of retaliation and tit for tat mentality. So equities came under severe selling pressure. And actually I was here at the time when the Dow I think it was about half five-ish or so, when just around when we hit the low, I think it was coming to six o'clock. Um, this came after Xi Jinping, the Chinese president, came out and in the Wall Street Journal, so the very paper I think that broke some of the, uh, the US administration comments of the weekend, they also came out with a new scoop citing the Chinese president in conversation with local CEOs of China saying, we will strike back at the US. <laughs> and those. Those words caused the Dow to fall at the, at the point where I was sitting here last night. It was down about 500 points at one point. Um, so looking at the S&P, uh, quite severe selling pressure. Uh, all the way up until the final half an hour, we had quite an aggressive snapback uh, where we've kind of just uh, gone sideways ever since. Uh, interestingly then, from a S&P performance, uh, that weekly strap report that we do and the level picking that Sam uh, does. He had that trend line marked up from around the, the 8th of May low, which is also that low seen at the kind of the beginning and the end of that month to some respect. Uh, and that played out quite nicely. Got just a touch below there before the market responded. Uh, and then in terms of the Dow, uh, although the futures didn't, 
Uh, the, the close on Wall Street did see the Dow Jones Industrial Average finish below its 200 DMA. Obviously quite a, a key psychological kind of technical uh, point as well. Uh, okay. The cash market finished below its 200 DMA for the first time in 501 trading days. Last time we did break or close below that level, just m making this chart a bit longer time frame, you would got to go all the way back to Brexit or the day of the EU referendum, which was right back here. The last time the Dow uh, in the cash market closed beneath that, that level. Uh, so... Getting close to some significant levels, if we look at other, some other charts here, the major US stock inde indexes dropping more than 1%. So this is across the three majors, the NASDAQ comp we're looking at here with the Dow and the S&P on a one-day change. So going back, it's the first time since um, April, as you can see from this arrow, that we've had a simultaneous kind of sell-off, which really reflects the gravity of the situation and with the trade front. Although the technology took the brunt because it was um, certainly singled out as a sector, the entire mentality was, was kind of short across the board. Elsewhere, this isn't just a, a North American situation. We know that trade wars are bad for everyone and um, quite a lot of press coverage talking about the bear market now that we're looking at uh, in the Shanghai Composite, which is the main stock index. You remember last week, I think it was Tuesday when the Chinese returned from their market holiday and this was when Trump put out those 200 billion of new tariffs would be met with a further 200 if China retaliated. That was when we broke 3,000 and at the time that was quite pivotal because it's the first time we've been that low in about two years going back to the summer of 2016. Well since we've broken that, that psychological level it's just remained really heavy uh, in the local market to the point where year to date, really just after the Jan period, we've dropped now 20%. Um, what I think is a little bit of a false representation here is Bloomberg obviously are making the point about how dramatic this fall is, but that's because they've, they've quite, quite purposefully cut off the left-hand side of this chart. So it looks like these are fantastically low price points, which we've never been before. But Here's a bit more of a broader chart. I mean, what Bloomberg were looking at was just this little right-hand section here, really. However, down at these levels, if you just go back to around the beginning of 2016, it's around 27.69 we were trading. Uh, so if we go back to here, uh, about another 100 points lower would be back down to the 2016 lows, but a breach of that then goes all the way back to 2014 territory when we start talking about a 2500 handle. Uh, but Chinese markets still under um, some considerable uh, pressure. We've seen the PBOC step in and alter the reserve requirement ratio the other day as they look to try and kind of mitigate um, any fears that might create tightening in the liquidity situation to kind of free up some of the, the capital on the smaller size banks locally. Um, but the one interesting thing that happened last night with this whole saga was that the um, trade secretary, um, Navarro, came out and basically said uh, the complete opposite of probably what you would expect him to say. Um, now, he's known as, as kind of a hawk on the trade side, i.e. he's been a big um, proponent of talking quite a tough game on the international trade scene. But such is, I would say, Trump and his sensitivities to specifically stock market movement from a public perception. Because from a, you know, a ground level, what's something that's been very prevalent for Trump in his communication is that he loves talking up the stock market because he knows that really resonates with the voting electorate on the ground because they rightly or wrongly, really equate an economy's strength to the performance of the stock market. Now, we know that's not quite as clear as that, but, but that's what he has shown, his frequency of tweeting. I think when the stock market's gone up over a year period, I think in 2017, he tweeted something like 50-ish times. When it went down, he only tweeted once. 
So he definitely likes to talk up his book, if you like. And when the Dow was down 500 points yesterday, you know, just you know, thinking about it and the way he tends to operate, I'm sure this is something which he definitely, although he wants to be aggressive, that he's putting America first and fighting the battle for the greater good of the USA, he wants to do it in a managed way where certainly he doesn't see a dramatic sell-off in the stock market because then managing broader public perception becomes quite difficult then to sustain his argument about how well the US economy is doing, stock markets up, unemployment record low, so on and so forth. So quite, I think, meaningfully by the administration, they sent out the trade hawk to sound quite let's in this sense, dovish, and to say, well, hold on a minute. This isn't quite as far-reaching as, as, as you might think. The stock market's overreacted. So he came out and basically sounded the complete opposite of what he normally would, and certainly that's helped some of the market sentiment just recover, at least for the time being. So that being the, the trade advisor, Peter Navarro. I'm just trying to pick out his specific comments he made they were they were quite interesting but essentially he was trying to talk the market back up in that sense how long the market though will believe this type of quite obvious i think tactic is yet to be seen because as we're talking now equity markets just softening up a touch as the dax future touches lows and the s p touches or moves into negative territory um, one thing though with trade talk heating up one thing that was quite prevalent last week was that um, the actual beginning part of the week when we saw a little bit of equity weakness, the dollar actually strengthened in a traditional kind of flight to quality move. The one thing that's happening yesterday was the dollar actually uh, was weaker. Now, just having a look at the euro here, I guess if we start looking at this chart to bring into context the, the kind of severity of the euro weakness that came on the back of the ECB dovish uh, communication from their last meeting. We have recovered quite a large portion of that move already. We've kind of found a bit of a hiatus a around the 118 handle. Upside um, is quite a significant point of resistance, just around that R1, the 118.16.15 area. It's kind of the, the lower bound of the price activity in the week in the run into the ECB announcement. It was also quite an interesting level of resistance prior to that, the end of May and early June. Uh, so upside, there certainly is some, some barriers to be aware of. Uh, any pullback, you've got pivot, uh, probably a near-term point of support for the euro currency with just belie beneath uh, the high on the 22nd, uh, which is about uh, seven, eight pips below there in the futures. Um, so yeah, a bit of dollar weakness, actually. And it, what seems to be the case, and it's quite a tricky one to judge, is that um, trade wars generally creates a, a flight to quality which means that more often than not people move into the dollar as the global reserve currency but if if the US um, pushed the envelope too far and China as yesterday Xi Jinping responds quite forcefully verbally that he's willing to counteract this um, and strike back just those words then if this starts to move over and drops into the next realm of, well, actually, this could be highly devastating for the US as well as the global economy, then everything starts to fall at that point. So, um, yeah, it's a bit of a tricky one to judge. Um, but at the moment, the dollar actually is recovering a little bit as some of this, um, this possible negative sentiment just feeds slowly back into the market. The one thing is gold is not responding at this point. Um, so that traditional, again, kind of move into safer, safer havens uh, hasn't quite been materialising. So from a correlations point of view, it is a little bit tricky this morning. It's not as clear cut as maybe you would uh, be expecting to see. So when it's like that, I would just be a little bit mindful of your uh, kind of aggressiveness in any strategies you might be thinking. When the correlations aren't particularly clear, it's usually better to then err on the side of uh, a little bit of caution or conservatism until things start to become uh, with a bit more clarity. One thing for sure, the trade situation predominantly is driven by the, by the American markets. 
That's where the predominant amount of the news flow is. That's where yesterday and weeks gone by, we see the predominant amount of the, the market movement. And I'd be expecting that to probably be the same case again today, if you're thinking about how to approach the session uh, ahead. Quick look at the calendar then. Certainly a couple of things to be aware of. And that is, from a morning's point of view for economic data, it's very quiet. You've got um, mortgage application data coming out of the UK, but this very seldom does that move the market. It's not so much of a consideration, I'd say, if you're, if you're looking at the pound. The one thing, though, that will be interesting this morning is this. From a speaker point of view, you've got Jonathan Haskell. Now, the reason why this is quite interesting is because this is the Treasury Select Committee hearing about the appointment of Jonathan Haskell. And Haskell is the replacement of the outlying uber hawk of the BOE MPC, uh, McCafferty. And McCafferty is actually speaking later on today as well, uh, actually at a different event. So quite interestingly, the chap who's going to be leaving at the end of August. So you're going to see of the two, if I was to pick one, it's Haskell, which is probably the most interesting. Does he show his hand and show his true colours as to whether or not he is a like-for-like -like hawk replacement for McCafferty, or is he slightly more uh, on a more neutral basis? Uh, that could be quite interesting for sure. Normally, at these TSC meetings, um, Haskell will be fully aware of the markets kind of sensitivity to the words he might say today, even though he has not even begun his position, the market can and will respond if he says something out of turn. So um, I'll share the link when that becomes live, but that's going to commence at 10. McCafferty then is going to be at 10.30, but we kind of know his view. He voted alongside Saunders and Haldane, of course, for the vote, and he's pushing for a hike for a number of months. So you can kind of almost expect to hear a hawkish tone from him. Usually outgoing um, policy members tend to just really ram home the point of their view. If anything, their view becomes even more accentuated in a sense because they're departing, they feel it's their, their passage to kind of finish with their strong views. Um, so if anything, he's going to be hawkish. Haskell's key. Going into the US afternoon, uh, from an economic data point, there's not a lot coming out at all in the early part. It's going to be the three o'clock releases where we're looking out for U.S. consumer confidence, uh, which is probably the main number of the afternoon. The API inventory data not as per usual until later on in the evening. Um, Speaker-wise, though, you do have the vice president of the ECB speaking, um, De Guindos, a couple of Fed speakers, but they're not coming until uh, the latter part of the, the afternoon. So that's pretty, pretty much it, really. Um, what I would say is that um, although consumer confidence, as I, as I mentioned, is a fairly significant piece of economic data, I would say today is probably going to be much like a repeat of yesterday, where the biggest influence, I feel, for the session will be derived from the trade situation. And we've had a lot of movement in commentary from both sides of a fairly significant nature, the US really ramping it up. Navarro, the trade secretary, trying to balance it out a little bit, given the negative response in the market. But importantly, um, the comments from Xi Jinping were for the Chinese, who have been incredibly diplomatic throughout, was a bit of an escalation. Do we get that? Do we get any type of response on the equal level from the likes of Europe that could initiate another round of selling? Given the fact that technically, uh, in like we said, the Dow last night closing below the 200 DMA, the market's at quite a, a key level technically where if we get another severe down day, it could certainly, in the right fundamental developments, equate to some, some sizable moves. So I would say level picking for how you'd want to play that as an execution point of view uh, in the equity space would be something which would be probably prudent planning going forward. Um, and then likewise, whether that plays out then uh, in a currency reaction for the dollar, again, for the euro and the pound, certainly for the pound, there's a couple of risks surrounding the Haskell commentary. But I'd say that for the currency markets, 
I'd probably be more looking for dollar movement to define the direction uh, for the trading session ahead. All right, um, I'm going to wrap it up there. From a technical perspective, I'll get Sam to share a few thoughts uh, in the chat room. Otherwise, I'm going to wish you a good day uh, and let you guys push on. Okay, have a good one.